Good day from Lusaka, Zambia. My name is Dr. Joel Amegwa. I'm an assistant professor of African Security Studies and the Africa Center's faculty lead on youth, peace, and security. I'd like to extend my warm uh, welcome to our friends, colleagues, and partners across the African continent and beyond who have registered for today's webinar entitled The Role of Youth in Democratic Resilience and Governance in Africa. Before I introduce the objectives of the webinar, I'd like to turn over to our director, Ms. Amadadori, for remarks. Good morning, good day, bonjour, bon dia, assalamu alaikum. It's a pleasure to greet you today from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies here in Washington, D.C., on the campus of the National Defense University, and to have Africa Center staff including Dr. Omegbo in Lusaka, where he is completing a, a program there. And just to be able to operate from so many different locations simultaneously remains one of the silver linings from COVID, where the technology leap has really enabled our ability to communicate more broadly. My name is Amanda Dory, and it's my honor to serve as the Africa Center's director. And I'm really pleased so many youth Africa Center alumni and special partners are participating with us today. In particular, I'd like to mention the partnership we have with the African Union's Office of the Youth Envoy and Youth for Peace program. And this collaboration, I think, is very valuable in terms of expanding the signal across our respective networks when it comes to these important topics. We have an excellent panel today to talk about the part that youth can play in democratic resilience. As we all appreciate, democracy is under pressure all over the world, and comparative learning can help us identify solutions as we think about the important resource represented by youth activism and participation. The Africa Center is 25 years old now, so still quite youthful, uh, and chartered by the, the U.S. Congress, and we conduct academic programs and research related to the full range of security challenges in Africa. The vision that we're working towards is security for all Africans, championed by effective institutions that are accountable to all of their citizens, and certainly including those who aren't old enough to vote yet. The program today is in support of that vision and uses our methodology of dialogue, peer learning, and seeking to catalyze strategic solutions. Before I turn you over to Dr. Joelle Megbo to lead the program, I would also just remind that our website has a wealth of resources and all of our latest research. It's located at www.africacenter.org, uh, and many of the resources are available in, in multiple languages. So with that, again, uh, good morning, good day, and let me turn it over to Dr. Joelle. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Let me introduce the objectives for today's webinar. Uh, in this webinar, we will, one, discuss the state of democracy and barriers to democratic success in Africa. We'll try to expand our understanding and share the practical experiences of young people and of youth engagement in democratic governance in Africa. And then we'll also explore and examine lessons learned and practical approaches for fostering youth involvement in democratic governance in Africa. Without wasting any time, uh, let me introduce our panelists. I am pleased to welcome experts who will help us develop the objectives that I shared with you based on their wealth of knowledge and experience. You have their full biographies on the webinar website, also pasted in the Zoom chat. So I'll just highlight a few pertinent points about each of them. And so I'll start with Dr. Nzioka Kaleke. She'll be our first speaker for today. She's an accomplished project manager, democracy and governance specialist with over seven years of experience leading complex initiative in the national and international development sector. She has experience in research, social inclusion, project design and implementation, policy development and analysis, stakeholder engagement, capacity building, and its related praxis. Our second speaker will be uh, uh, Ms. Asafika Mpako. 
She's the communications coordinator for Southern Africa at Afrobarometer. Uh, she previously held the role of project officer at the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation, working on the development and implementation of the Data for Governance Alliance project, which aims to enhance democracy, governance, and human rights on the continent. Having studied in South Africa, China, and the UK, uh, Ms. Asafika holds two master's degree in public policy and public administration from Perkins University and the London School of Economics, respectively. Uh, it's also worth noting that she recently been, uh, has been named a Mandela Washington Fellow and will participate in a leadership institute studying public management at a US university. And our third panelist, uh, Mr. Florendo uh, Chivukute, is the founder and executive director of Friends of Angola. Uh, Florendo earned his master's degree in conflict analysis and resolution from George Mason University in uh, Arlington, Virginia. He has over 10 years of experience working in nonprofit organizations, international development, international relations, peace building, and education while being active in the community of Portuguese speaking countries. Since founding Friends of Angola in 2014, he has led the design and implementation of multiple projects, including Radio Angola, an online radio station, strengthening nonviolent civic engagement among the youth, strengthening democracy in Angola through community journalism, developing leadership skills and democratic value for Angolan young men and women, and anti-kleptocracy project in Angola. And he has published uh, uh, in a few uh, outlets as well. One of those publications is Urban Youth Activism and Peace Process in Angola. We are absolutely delighted to have three of the, uh, the distinguished uh, panelists. Let me start with uh, Dr. Nzioka. And so the process will be, I'll ask three questions to uh, each panelist. They will have about 10 minutes to 15 minutes to make their presentation. Dr. Nzioka will speak in English, then we'll follow with uh, uh, Ms. Mpako, she'll also speak in English, and uh, Mr. Florando will also will speak in uh, Portuguese. So let me start with Dr. Nzioka. Dr. Nzioka, in about 10 to 15 minutes, based on your experience, could you please explain uh, to our participants what we really mean by democracy and good governance? What are the rationales and models for engaging young people in democracy and good governance? And also, please highlight how providing youth-led spaces and responsibility over policies could promote good governance, inclusion, and democracy in Africa. You have about 10 uh, to 15 minutes to do so. So over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Zoro, for the amazing introduction. Good afternoon, good morning, Abarizena. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, amazing conversation. And um, I'll just go straight and to talk in the very first question that uh, we are supposed to look at uh, what, what is democracy? What do we mean by where we say uh, good governance? And I love to answer this question by giving a very short story. Uh, growing up, I never loved eating cabbage. This was not just me, but also my siblings. And my mother noticed this for a very long time. For her to really make sure that her food was not going to waste, then she had to involve us. At some point, she had to call up for a meeting and we had to come up with a timetable on when and what to eat. And by that, we all ended up eating the cabbage that we never wanted to eat as important. So if you look at this, we could say that democracy is a form of a is a form of government in a power which is held by people. And either this can be directly or through elected representatives. So my mother made sure that we participated in making rules of the house and by so doing we became practitioners of these rules. So I think that uh, it will be very uh, correct for us to say that uh, wherever there is, uh, we were talking about democracy, we'll always be talking about um, the 
helping and uh, in giving out power either directly or indirectly. And then I'll go through the the definition of uh, good governance. If we talk about something uh, being good, it means that we are also talking about uh, it's being effective, it's being uh, the management level of it uh, being up to a point that uh, can be measured to a certain standard. So good governance can be referred to the effective and efficient management of public resources and affairs in a transparent and accountable manner. So you'll ask why are we looking at governance, why are we looking at democracy, and what is the rationale as uh, that this uh, what is the rationale to the youth when we're talking about uh, uh, democracy and good governance and this definitely is because uh, the youth uh, represent a significant proportion of the population that we have in the african continent and have a stake in decisions that affect their lives and also the lives of other people who are part and parcel of their continent. And uh, engaging the youth um, in the democratic processes will help in particular uh, areas. First of all, it will help and promote participation, it will help uh, promote uh, inclusion and uh, presentation in decision making, as well as uh, encourage, encouraging civic education and uh, culture, uh, culture and uh, accountability then if this is uh, what the youths are able to bring on the table what are some of the ways that we can really bring in the youths uh, on the board allow me to take you through uh, some of the models that uh, the youth can be engaged in promoting good governance and uh, democracy in our continent the very first one is uh, uh, having youth-led organizations and I'm so I'm so sure that uh, in one way or the other, on our daily uh, interactions and our daily duties, we are able to interact with a youth-led organization. This youth-led organization provides platforms for young people to engage in democratic processes and develop leadership skills. For instance, if a youth, if a if a youth uh, owns uh, probably an academic space he or she is uh he or she is responsible to impacting different uh, people in the society and through that they will be uh, contributing to the development of leadership skills in the continent another thing uh, that uh, we we could uh, look at when we talk about the youth engagement and uh, democracy and good governance is the youth participation in political parties uh, we uh, we come from different um, backgrounds, and over time we have uh, tasted and we have been witness of uh, the youths climbing the ladder into the political space. We could give examples from different uh, countries in the continent. And uh, when we en encourage young people to join political parties, this can help increase their representation in decision-making processes. We are always advocating that we need uh, young people in the decision-making tables. And the political parties uh, have been one of those uh, places that uh, the youths are uh, getting political uh, uh getting uh are being provided with uh, trainings and mentorship opportunities as young leaders we'll also look at um another way that we can uh, involve the youth we have a uh, youth advisory councils this uh, body is composed of uh, young people that provide input and advice to government officials and uh, on issues affecting young people for different governments to really tackle on um, specific issues that are affecting the youth, then they need a bridge. And this bridge is uh, can be catered for by having youth advisory councils that definitely will provide with uh, the right the, the right voices and the right perspectives that the young people need to be at. This would uh, uh, bring in uh, proper policies being made because uh, the information or the 
the issues will be dealt uh, with from the grassroots. We also have uh, youth uh, parliaments. Youth parliaments are designed to provide a uh, platforms for young people to engage in democratic uh, processes and stimulate the, uh, uh, the workings of, uh, of the national government. So the youth help to build the capacity of, uh, of uh, young leaders and promote civ uh, civic education. And um, if, uh, if uh, I could just wrap that all up, we, we could say that uh, engaging youth in democracy and good governance is essential for promoting inclusive uh, and representative, uh, re re representative uh, decision making and developing the next generation of leaders. So if uh, you'll allow me to go direct to the uh, second part of the, of the question, uh, we'd, we'd be looking at uh, how, how has Africa as a continent gone through democracy, what are some of the achievements that uh, as a continent we've been able to achieve, and also some of the challenges that the continent is facing. Well, we are, uh, when we look at uh, democracy and uh, over, over, the first, uh, over the few decades, uh, we could say that many African countries have made significant forces towards uh, democracy and governance. We could also be right to say that um, there have been some challenges that still remain in the past to achieve full democratic governance in a, a long and complex uh, way. So some, some of the key progress uh, that African countries have been able to make towards democratic, uh, uh, towards democratic governance, uh, we could uh, start with the adoption of democratic constitutions. And uh, it's evident that many African countries have adopted new constitutions that uh, enshrine democratic uh, principles such as free and fair elections, separation of power and protection of human rights. We could also talk of uh, the increased political participation. When we talk of uh, increased uh, political participation, there has been a significant increase in political participation across the, conti the continent with more citizens engaged. I think Dr. Nzioko is having some challenges. Uh, what I'll do is I will stop uh, here and I'll move straight to uh, Ms. Mpako. Uh, Ms. Mpako, uh, while we wait for Dr. Nzioko to come back, uh, if you could please shed some light on the status of youth participation in democracy and governance in Africa. Uh, Dr. Nzioko was talking about youth participation, and so we'd like to hear the data. What does the data show us, you know, especially from uh, Afrobarometer? Uh, what is the empirical evidence in supporting? you know, what she was just mentioning. And if you could also highlight how providing youth-led spaces and responsibility over, you know, policies could help promote good governance, inclusion, and democracy in Africa. So you have about 10 to 15 minutes as well. Thank you so much, Joelle, and good day, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. I'm calling in from Pretoria, South Africa, um, as you might know, we're experiencing load shedding troubles, so I'm just hoping my internet will hold up. As has been said, my name is Asafi Gampago, and I am the Communications Coordinator for Southern Africa for Afrobarometer. If I could just share my screen. So for those of there you in the audience, so the title of my presentation is I'd just like to start with and political engagement. And I will Afrobarometer share is a pan highlight from the Afrobarometer around night organization that provides reliable data on African experiences and evaluations of democracy, governance, and quality of life. We have been doing this work since the year 1999 and to date. We have conducted surveys in up to 39 countries across the African continent. Round nine surveys are currently underway and our target is to cover 39 countries on the continent. And in doing this work, we have one primary objective and that is to give Africans a voice in policymaking and decision-making by providing high quality, reliable public opinion data to policymakers, policy advocates, civil society organizations, 
the donors, the news media, academics, and of course, to Africans themselves. Uh, from the map here, you can see where we first surveyed, uh, starting in the year 1999 uh, uh, up to 2001. We started in 12 African countries, which include Mali, Nigeria, Ghana, Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, Namibia, Lesotho, South Africa. And of course, as I said to you before, we have now expanded to cover up to uh, 38 countries on the continent and our target is to go up to 39 this round. So what is our methodology? We use nationally representative samples of adult citizens. And what that means is that all our respondents are randomly selected and the sample is distributed across regions, states, um, provinces and urban and rural areas in proportion to their share in the national population. We conduct our interviews face to face and in the language of the respondent's choice. And we use a standard questionnaire that allows for comparison across countries and over time. And then we also use sample sizes of between 1,200 to 2,400 citizens, which yields margins of sampling error of plus minus two to three percent. Moving now to the findings. Um, one, number one on the agenda is unemployment. Unemployment we have found is the youth's biggest problem. So unemployment tops the list of most important problems that young Africans want their government to address. This is followed by management of the economy, by health, by education, infrastructure and roads, and the list goes on. But when we ask our respondents what, in their opinion, is the most important problem facing their country that government should address, time and time again, young people have said that it is unemployment. So young Africans are, on average, more educated than their elders. The data shows that, that a majority, that is 65% of 18 to 35 year olds have at least some secondary education compared to 48% and 33% respectively of the middle and senior age brackets. But while almost all of, of, of youth are in, in Mauritius, in Zimbabwe, in Cape Verde, in Gabon, and in Tunisia, while all of them, almost all of them, have been to school, about half in Niger, that is 53%, have no formal education. African youth are also considerably more likely than their elders to be out of work and looking for a job. Our data shows that 39% of youth versus 28% of those in the age bracket 36 to 55 years, and 14% of those in the age bracket 56 years and above are unemployed and looking for jobs. Now, unemployment rates reported uh, by young people range up to 67% in Angola, 60% in Botswana, and 57% in Lesotho, 52% in Sierra Leone, 51% in Liberia, and 51% in Niger. Consistently, African governments are graded poorly for their perform performance in creating jobs. Only two in 10 Africans say their government is doing a good job of meeting the needs of, of, of youth by way of creating jobs. Young and older respondents offer almost identical assessments of the government's performance in this regard. Now the question is, do the youth want democracy? Preference for democracy and rejection of authoritarian rule is high across different generations. It's worth noting, however, that younger Africans under 35 are slightly more opposed to one party rule. 81% in this age group reject 
one party rule um, versus 77% of those in the age bracket 56 years and above. But the opposite appears to be true for military rule where young people are slightly less opposed. So here we find that 66% um, uh, of younger people are opposed versus 69% of older people. Overall, support for democracy is also slightly higher among older people compared to younger people. Let's turn now to dissatisfaction with democracy. Young adults, we find, are slightly more likely than elders to say that they are not very satisfied or not at all satisfied with the way that democracy is functioning in their country. We find that three in five of every um, of young people in the age bracket, 18 to 35, say that they are dissatisfied with the way that democracy is functioning in their country. And then moving on to perceptions of corruption among institutions, the youth are particularly critical of institutional corruption. We found that 50% of young people in the age group 18 to 35 um, perceive corruption in the police, 42% in the officers perceive corruption in the office of the presidency, 41% perceive corruption amongst members of parliament in their country, and 38% perceive corruption among judges and magistrates. Moving now to trust in government and in social institutions. Here too, the youth show considerable distrust in their public institutions. When asked how much do you trust each of the following, only 61% of youth say that they, they trust the army compared to 64% of those in the age bracket 36 to 55 years and 68% of those aged between age over 56 years. Moving on to the office of the presidency, only 44% of young people say they trust the office of the presidency in their country compared to 48% of those aged 36 to 55 years and 54% of those 50 year, 56 years and above. Again, only 44% of youth say that they trust the courts of law in their country. Only 43% say that they trust the police. Only 36% say that they trust the electoral commission and only 33% say that they trust members of parliament. The big question, should the military intervene when elected leaders abuse power? When we posed this question to our respondents, we found that one troubling sign is the low popular opposition to military intervention and politics. On average, across 28 countries that we've surveyed between 2021 to 2022, only 43% agree that militaries should never intervene in politics, while a small majority, that is 53%, are willing to accept this option if elected leaders abuse power. The view that the military should intervene if elected officials abuse power is more popular among the younger generation. Close to six in 10, that is 56%, say that they would be in favor of the military intervening in politics, compared to 51% of those aged 36 to 55 years and 48% of those aged 56 years and above. Moving on now to political participation and civic engagement. What have we found here? Well, youth are less likely to be politically engaged than older citizens. The largest gaps are observed in the most fundamental form of voice and participation, that is voting. But young people also lag behind in other types of community participation and contact with leaders. So you'll find that only 44% of young people have attended a community meeting and only 40% say that they have joined others.
to raise an issue. An interesting topic, youth and digitization. We found here that young adults far exceed elders when it comes to the use of the internet and digital devices, which I suppose um, can be expected. Uh, the youth are about twice as likely as those older than 55 years to own smartphones and computers and to regularly use the internet and to get news from social media and the internet. We also find that uh, citizens, both youth and elders who have access to smartphones are more likely to be critical of the quality of democratic norms that they see in their countries. For instance, they are more likely to think that officials who commit crime go unpunished and that their elections are not free and fair and that most or all officials in the presidency are involved in corrupt dealings. What about the supply of democracy and um, accountability by internet use? We see a similar pattern when it comes to internet news consumption. Citizens who, assess, who access sorry, their news from the internet or social media are more likely to perceive official impunity. They are more likely to perceive corruption in the presidency, they are more likely to perceive poor quality of elections, and they are more likely to say that officials who commit crime often or always go unpunished. I'll leave it there for now. I look forward to a robust discussion hereafter. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mbako. I have a lot of questions for you, actually, uh, now that you're finished with the present the data, but let me turn over to uh, uh, Mr. Florendo, who will speak to the practical nature of the data. And so, Orlando, you are, Florendo, you are open to, uh, to push back against some of the data, if, uh, if possible. But I, the question for you really will be, uh, how are young men and women politically and socially engaged and already contributing to development, peace, and good governance uh, in Africa? And if you can also address some of the, you know, the uh, innovations that young people have you know, put out uh, in the promotion of peace, democracy, and governance in Africa. And so please speak practically about, you know, again, you're engaging uh, in, uh, on the ground with uh, uh, young people. And if you can also speak to you know, the progress that African countries have made and the role that young people can play in shaping cultures of practice and practices of democracy and good governance uh, in Africa. Uh, over to you, you have about 15 minutes. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Joel, for this opportunity. It is certainly a privilege to work with the youth in Angola. But before, I would like to say that uh, the contribution of the youth in uh, peace and development uh, worldwide is a fact. Unfortunately, what has happened is that we have not given enough credit to young people in various continents, but going back to the African continent and Angola, uh, the young people, the youth are in the front line of change. My country, Angola, is a country of you, uh, young people in the majority, and they have been pushing for change and uh, triggering um, the movement in a very stern way. And both women and, uh, and men uh, are doing specific things. They are creating movements within their communities. For instance, we have Upaka, one of the one most populous um, districts, neighborhoods in Luanda. Another thing is the Viana project also in Luanda. They are led by uh, young women and men. They are the ones 
in the front line. Uh, they uh, are uh, advocating for things to happen in Angola. They come to the streets, they uh, make petitions, and they are using many social uh, tools, not only and they are acting in uh, within urban areas, not so much in peri-urban areas. In Angola, uh, we have uh, a population uh, with low income, so a smartphone is a expensive device, but they have social movements. To be more specific, they are using, for some years they have, have been advocating for Angola to have local elections. Angola is one of the few countries in the continent who, that does not hold local elections. So in terms of the parties, the president of the um, party winning the elections. In this case, uh, the party has ruling the country since 1975, and they have been pressuring the authorities with meetings and using music uh, such as hip hop and theater. They use Facebook and Twitter to spread their message and to uh, advocate for the uh, Angolan government will implement um, peace policies. I think that the uh, panelist uh, who spoke before me um, mention some of the ways in which the uh, young people are acting. And in Angola, we have a significant number of members of civil society uh, that are now uh, parliamentarians because of uh, the uh, networking that they did with members of the civil society and so forth. What I think that is missing in a certain way is a lack of technical assistance so that this contribution they have made in terms of the movements for the uh, strengthening or, uh, of the peace process uh, since we have been struggling for decades in the political processes, there is need for technical assistance. It is not easy to work in questions related to democracy and good governance, because this is a very difficult environment. Uh, we don't have an open government, but they are resilient. They use methods such as uh, demonstrations. There was a demonstration in, in Angola after several attempts to uh, protest in the streets. Uh, several young people were beaten up uh, and they uh, have a constitutional right to have their voices heard. But the last demonstration I so in a way, there were some innovative uh, aspects. They demonstrated from their homes. They didn't need to go out of the house in order to do this. So it was a day of reflection. They didn't have to go and work in the streets in these demonstrations. This is an organic uh, process regardless of who is in power. There's no doubt that these uh, young people have been uh, talking about uh, unemployment and uh, problems uh, with transparency and uh, the peace process in Angola. They are also changing 
the culture of violence we witness in Angola since the civil war for many years uh, there has been this kind of culture um, but the youth are not uh, interested in violence they are interested in uh, solving uh, their uh, problems uh, employment is one of them education good health care and they resort to non-violent means to do that they demonstrate peacefully both uh, in person as well as remotely they use social media to voice their dissatisfaction and to give their opinion about how things could be and uh, to uh, demand more transparency uh, just to give an example, the, in the last budget, uh, state budget, there was a group of uh, young people that realized that a school that has been promised to, that should have been built in one of the provinces, the school was in fact built. Uh, the, yeah, they checked if the school was built, the hospital was built, and they question why millions of dollars are used to buy cars and houses for members of the Angolan executive power. When we have such dire problems, we have an enormous uh, debt, government debt to China. Why are we buying such expensive cars when we have this debt? with China and uh, we have to ask for funds from the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, they are playing their role, but uh, what has happened is that this uh, civic space uh, uh, has been open for some time, but then it was closed again. But And that concerns us. I work with the youth and we are seeing all the spaces in which they uh, used to uh, um, voice their opinions being closed. But we have hope because they are interested in politics as well. They uh, work in their communities, they create uh, movements, they talk about uh, the lack of water, of, uh, um, potable water and uh, energy, and they are willing to join political parties, not at the speed that we would like to see, uh, but they uh, there's also stigma and uh, th they believe that the uh, pol politicians have not fulfilled their role. So we have organizations, a number of organizations that I mentioned, and they're growing. What we've done is to help them in this transition. Uh, for example, an organization that is led and was created by one or two people, we help it to grow and to offer technical assist assistance. And then there's the uh, financial problem. Um, Angola has been classified as a as a poor country. A lot of people have left the country. And what's happened was there aren't funds for these youth groups to do the work that they should in an efficient way. I think that it's very important to know that what's happening in Angola is happening in other countries. Cape Verde is a country that's made a lot of headway as far as democracy is concerned. And we have uh, an exchange programs going on and uh, collaboration among youth of these countries. So 
collaboration not only within Angola, but with other countries. The internet allows for this um, kind of exchange at great distances. And I think that what we, where we've failed, um, the international community has not really um, expanded the civic space in which uh, youth can play their role so that they can continue their advocacy work before the entire population. But the youth are very resilient. I really admire them given the circumstances. One of the big problems that we is the problem of language. Portuguese isn't that widely spoken and there's very little information in Portuguese. Not only there's the problem that uh, of democracy in many countries like Angola, it's under pressure. The president of the center um, mentioned this in her introduction and there's the resilience of these youngsters, the young people that we should keep in mind. Democracy um, though is able to overcome ma many of these problems, many of these basic problems when we compare it to autocracy or totalitarian states. Another problem are these exchanges. Many of us are surrounded by countries that speak other languages. We have the Congo, we have Namibia, um, countries that speak French and English. So we're isolated in a certain way, but we're a very young country and we can also see similarities in terms of civic engagement. We have a, a lot of a lot that's done in the uh, area of uh, consolidation of peace, but what we lack is more support so that these, this youth can continue to contribute in a constructive way and that they don't feel that they're not, that they're abandoned and that they're in fact a very, very, a, a very positive force for society, and I'll end it there. Thank you, Florendo. Thank you, uh, uh, Asafika. We're, we're beginning on a good note. Uh, thank you again to both of you for your excellent insights on the critical topic that we're discussing. Uh, before we uh, we move on, uh, Florendo, I will. I have a question for you and uh, Asafika. Both of you address the you know the the technology aspect of uh, uh, democracy, and so for. Asafika, the question really is, how does the digital divide inform not only the, the digital divide uh, amongst age cohorts, but also how does it inform what type of uh, a democracy or what, what, how young people are well connected? And for Florendo, you talked about, you know, unemployment of, of young people in Angola, you know, given that unemployment is, you know, the top, it's at the top of the list of youth concerns, how do you feel youth are developing shared political agenda that informs their advocacy work? So I can give the, the chance to Asafika first and then uh, Florendo next. Over to you. Thanks, Joel. I think that um, because young people have grown up in the digital age with all the uh, social media, um, advances available to them, they have begun and are continuing to craft new ways of um, engaging in the political process. And I think that what, what political leaders and what uh, democracy activists have not done enough of is to in, go to where the young people are, to meet young people, 
where they are. A lot is said about young people not engaging in the traditional uh, po political processes that we are aware of. But I think that young people are bringing new meaning to, to the political game. They are developing new practices. And I think that more work needs to be done to understand the new space in which young people are operating. And we need to develop the adequate tools to engage in that space um, effectively and to also bring uh, the, the views and the, the understandings that young people share online uh, into decision-making processes and into the policy-making process. With that said, I also understand that there is a bulk of youth that isn't online and doesn't have access to, to the platforms that uh, young people share their views on and get news from. So we also need to develop new ways to engage those young people who, who don't have access to the internet as readily and who don't have access to smartphones. In, in sum, I think what I'm trying to say is that young people are developing new ways of engaging the political process. Um, and that is mirrored in low voter turnout in not as many participating in demonstration in the traditional way that we understand demonstrations. So I think that more research and work needs to go into understanding how young people are crafting new meaning in the political space and developing new practices to engage in that space. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Asafika. I'll give a chance to uh, uh, Florendo, over to you. Thank you very much. I think that the uh, question is very, very pertinent one. And, um, and I, I hope I'm not uh, repeating what's what's been said, but I wanted to say that there's something that I forgot to mention in terms of the participation of youth in Angola. The youth were very important in the, in the electoral process in Angola. It was incredible, not only in terms of the numbers of participation, but the way in which they um, monitored the electoral process. I wanted to leave that to bring this up um, in or, so that you understand how they participated in the political process in Angola with respect to unemployment. It's, this is a, we have a significant number of uh, youth who are um, emigrating from the country and there's a lot of disquiet um, especially um, on the part of the Angolan executive branch because they understand that uh, youth are putting a lot of pressure on them um, because um, they're responding to the promises of the uh, presidency that uh, more um, jobs be created, which didn't happen. So the president of the Republic is feeling this pressure from them. I would say that unemployment is one of the one of the most consistent demands that we're witnessing in Angola. I don't have to tell you about the consequences of unemployment and what unemployment means for particular lives. And I agree with the um, conclusion that the great majority aren't in the, online, don't have access to the internet. What's happened in Angola is that there are young people who organize workshops, um, sometimes at zero cost, 
so that they can interact better with their communities. But there's a lot of work to do. And what keeps me up at night are these um, problems. There's that push and pull for, on the one hand, we have those who believe that we should involve uh, youth because they're fundamental to any change. It seems that they're five steps ahead in, in terms of the of dealings with the government, but it's important to remind ourselves that it's important to give space to youth. We also have youth who are fundamental to the work in society, but we also have other groups who have um, bad intentions and who use this as a tool of discontent. We talked about 67% of uh, unemployment in Angola. It might even be higher than that. My colleague, I'm sorry if I haven't pronounced your name properly, but this is, isn't, this affects the police process as well, because this can serve as a tool for those with bad intentions. The, the many young people are recruited to take part in terrorist groups. For example, in Nigeria, we have uh, Cabo Delgado in Mozambique, discontented youth being conscripted in these groups. Um, the international community has extended assistance and loans, but they have a certain responsibility. We have to count on them. They shouldn't really invest in countries um, without investing in the in the people. And, and we have the problem of many um, politicians who send their money abroad and who exercise corruption and I'll leave it there. Th thank you so much, Florendo, and thank you, Asafika. We have our colleague, Dr. Zioka, who joined us also. Uh, I'll be giving her the floor uh, next, but I think we spent some time, you know, talking about the challenges that, you know, young people face when it comes to the civic space uh, and the democracy and governance across the, the African continent. I think I want to move the debate a little bit, you know, to the other side and talk about the opportunities. What could, you know, the international community, what could countries do or government do to actually create the space, right? Because we were just talking about, you know, restricted, restricted spaces for, for young people to actually exercise, you know, their, 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 their votes, for example. What could we do, you know, both as young people, governments and international uh, uh, communities to actually open up this space for young people to thrive? And also, how can young people contribute, right, to, you know, lowering the, you know, the unemployment rate, for example. So let me start with uh, Dr. Nzioka. And then I'll give the chance to uh, to Florendo. Then I'll come to uh, 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 Asafika and uh, you know colleagues on the line. If you have questions, please type your questions in the chat, and then I'll be willing to uh, I'll, I'll I'll ask the questions as we go on. So, Dr. Nzioka, uh, the the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I disappeared at some point, technical issues. I think that should be outlined as one of the problems that we are facing. <laughs> And, uh, and achieving uh, various uh, developments. So one of the opportunity that uh, the government, uh, different governments could uh, probably look into as per the question that uh, you've uh, given is um, increase civic uh, education. Most, 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 of, most of, our, of the youths, we, we are willing to I think we have encountered the same uh, problem again one more time. And so I will give the chance to uh, uh, Asafika um, if you. 
we'll give the chance to uh, Asafika to take over while we address uh, Dr. Nziokas uh, uh, internet problem. So Asafika, over to you. Thanks, Joel. I think this is um, a very important question and one that should remain at the top of our minds always is what can we do to improve the situation of young people in this continent? What are the opportunities? I think that uh, there's a lot that can be done. I think that in particular, I'd, I'd like to start with the role that I believe the international community can play in, in supporting young people. I, I have often pondered on why there aren't enough opportunities to help young people uh, who have dropped out of school, for instance. Uh, there are lots of opportunities presented by the international community for scholarships, for instance, to study abroad. I have been a beneficiary of those. Um, the Mandela Washington Fellowship is another initiative that um, strengthens young people's skills and enables them to take their careers to the next level. But I worry that not enough is done to support young people who have not progressed academically and have been left behind uh, because of that. So I think that there's a lot of scope to support young people who have dropped out of school and we could strategize on some initiatives that would help those young people to build uh, lives for themselves. I think that there's a lot of support and um, funding that can go into helping young entrepreneurs build their businesses. A lot has been said about the value of, on, of entrepreneurship on the continent. And through the literature, through reading the literature, we can all see that a consistent problem that entrepreneurs face is that of funding and lack of access to social networks that will enable them to scale their businesses and, and take them to the next level. So I think that there's a lot of scope for support in that area. Uh, we've, been, we've been talking a lot about the African continental free trade area. How can we support young Africans to participate effectively in that initiative? I think that's a question that we should be, that we should be asking ourselves. Um, and of course, uh, our governments, um, young people have said consistently in the Afrobarometer questionnaires and our surveys that governments are not doing enough to support young people. And at the root of that, uh, in large part, I would argue is the question of corruption. So I think that a lot more has to be done um, by the international community, but also by civil society to watch over, <laughs> to watch over government and to keep government accountable. And the news media as well, I, I would say has a huge role to play in this. And in our surveys as Afrobarometer, citizens have consistently said that they endorse the media as a watchdog over, um, over government. They want the media to keep government accountable and to expose corrupt dealings. So I think that there's a lot that different sectors of society can do. And another thing that I'd like to add is the value of coll collaboration. A lot has been said about organizations working in silos. Um, I think that uh, there's a lot of scope for us to partner on different initiatives so that we can strengthen uh, our cause and uh, deliver change for, for the African people. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mbako. Uh, I'll move on to uh, uh, Florendo. Uh, the question really is about, you know, changing, you know, the scope, looking at the, the opportunities that young people can, uh, can, can provide even in government. And I think one of those is, do you see any space for young people to participate? I think you talked about the, the budget, how young people were you know, willing to look into budgets and to you know, play the role of oversight that uh, you know, uh, Ms. Asafika just spoke about. And uh, again, you, uh, you are the founder of uh, uh, Radio Angola. Could you also speak about some of the positive initiatives that are out there that we can, again, 
elevate your youth voices in the way that you know we're moving you know the opportunities that young people are bringing to the table over to you thank you very much uh dr joel i didn't get the first part of your question i had a problem with the connection uh, can you repeat your question please yes please the question really is about looking at the opportunities that young people you know bring uh, with them right so you talked about the budget for example in, in angola where young people were involved uh, in, in pushing back or playing the role of oversight in, in this case and you yourself as you know the founder of radio angola what do you see as opportunities that young people can uh, you know can 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 bring to the table and how young people can actually play a role in lowering uh, the the unemployment rate for example and so wanted to hear from you on the positive lights what are some of the things that you really think young people can do or you know governments can do or international community can do to really advance uh, you, you know or elevate youth voices when it comes to political processes and uh, and democrat and democracy uh, thank you very much, Dr. Joel. I think uh, that the work that the youth have been doing in terms of monitoring how the budget uh, is applied is a work. Under the circumstances in which we live, it's uh, the kind of work that means a lot. It's significant because of the efforts that these uh, young people uh, put into that. I uh, value this wor their work, uh, their voices, and we have to have more space so that they can tackle these questions. The, big problem, unfortunately, is that in the traditional media, they don't have a voice in uh, newspapers, in television, in the public television, you only have two national channels. Um, so they have very limited spaces to work with. We have some uh, community means, but a few of these young people have access to resources. If we give these young people the opportunity to talk about the issues and uh, about the, uh, the research work that have they have been doing, then uh, their impact will be improved in the first place to uh, have a um over a, a view of what the uh, unemployment situation is uh, in part uh, international investors are not in interested to go to angola they could uh, give some support as well but the judiciary is uh, not very strong uh, in terms of entrepreneurship and uh, in terms of uh, human rights, uh, there's a lack of support as well. The role of the government would be to tackle these situations with more seriousness. One of the things that the government should do and the private sector as well, but the governments mainly should listen to these young people and implement policies based on the contribution of these communities, particularly the youth, because they are suffered the brunt of unemployment. So the impact on the young people is much higher than the group of adults. The international community, such as the World Bank and the IMF, I'm not going to mention China much because they are not an open uh, country uh, and they have a way of dealing with uh, so, uh, civil society in a different form. 
so I think that the, the Chinese contributed a lot to uh, bring uh, the country's economy to an abyss. But uh, maybe if we could uh, educate the members of the executive branch and uh, make them think about the fact that uh, finan the financial assistance from uh, international organizations come with a price because there are uh, interest, there's interest to pay and so forth. And in, so in terms of education, there has to be more inv investment compared to other uh, African countries. We invest more, 10 times more in the armed forces than in healthcare, for instance, even if we are not in a wartime. There are um, young people uh, that are eager to study, but they don't have the necessary means. So uh, there should be also innovative uh, ideas to create uh, new academic programs and the responsibility of the oil companies, uh, the mining companies, they do not invest in the communities in which they are um, working. Uh, there are situations of uh, hunger and poverty in the provinces of Cabinda, for instance, and uh, Lunda, Lunda North and Lunda South. Uh, there's no social responsibility when they engage in projects for the communities. They have a short list of, uh, that uh, is approved by uh, the authorities. And I, uh, I can speak to that I, uh, because I have that knowledge, but the government has to be more serious in the first place. Uh, they have to be aware of what they are doing, but they have to tackle the problems that affect the, the people in general and uh, promote uh, the conditions for businesses to be developed. Uh, it is difficult to create a, a small business. There's lack of uh, bank loans to young people who don't have uh, collateral um, uh, guarantees. It is impossible to uh, have a loan uh, from uh, these uh, banks, commercial banks. In order to reduce the problem of uh, unemployment in Angola. Thank you very much. No, th thank you, Florendo and uh, Asafika. I think I'm going to go back again to uh, to looking at the, uh, the 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 opportunities, and partly because again I want to move the debate to uh, to the positive uh, 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 space. I think there's a question that came in, and and this has to do again with uh, uh, elections, governance, and uh, and democracy. And the question here is given that young people distrust uh, political institutions, right? So as Africa, you talked about the level of distrust for political institutions on, on the continent by young people. You know, young people are not well immersed in uh, formal politics. So what can we do to create a more political or durable political environment in the future uh, for young people? Again, the shifting the, the, the narrative towards the positive just looking at what young people could do or to contribute to an atmosphere where you know they are you know in charge of of, of processes i think you know if you can uh, speak to that as well and uh, florenda i wanted to also go back to the issue of language that you talked about before right you talked about you know uh, uh, angola being a lusophone country and that you are being uh, you are isolated how do you think youth in angola have been navigating you know this challenge of, uh, uh, you know, the challenge of being isolated, especially when it comes to uh, to, to language. So I'll give the chance to uh, Asafika. I know we have only 13 minutes, so I'll give you the chance to speak uh, for about uh, four to five minutes each. Uh, over to you. 
Thanks so much, Joelle. I'll start by admitting that it is not a, an easy uh, question to answer, but I'll attempt to do it justice. I think that we need to begin by assessing what is at the root of the, the distrust. Um, and I think that a huge part of it has to do with the fact that African governments have not delivered on their promises. Um, that coupled with the issue of corruption, which is um, a prominent conversation on the continent. So I think that that's where we need to start uh, by looking at the root so that we're assured that we're not treating the symptoms, but that we're, we're looking at the root causes and uprooting um, the evil, so to speak, um, from where it emanate, emanates from. So I think that in this regard, African governments need to take some responsibility for the, the loss of trust that young people have, you know, come to, to have. And it's not just among young people, but it's also evident in in other age brackets as well. So I think that African governments need to take responsibility for that and start to do better. And by do better, I think that they need to stop marginalizing young people. A lot has been said about the fact that young people on this continent are marginalized, that they aren't included in traditional, policy and political processes. And it, it doesn't have to do with the fact that young people aren't interested. I believe that young people are greatly interested in partaking in these processes and being included, but the doors are, are shut to young people. And so I think that African governments need to make more of an effort in including young people in these processes and having young people uh, lead in, in, on youth issues, on, on issues that are pertinent to young people and to have young people in the room where important decisions are made. And I'll add here that I, I think it's also important that young people's voices are reflected in the international arena where big decisions are made about what goes on domestically in African countries. So I think that in that respect, our African governments have a huge role to play, but the international community as well has a huge role to play in recognizing that African youth need to be included in the room where big decisions are made. And a, a, a big slogan that came out of recent social movements by young people is, nothing with, uh, about us without us. And I think that I want to echo that sentiment here. Nothing about us without us. We want to be included in the rooms where big decisions are made. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Safika. I'll be coming back to you for one more round with just a, a request for you to give, if you had to give an advice to young people on the line, and also to policymakers who are also listening to you, what would that advice be? But I'll come to you in a, in a minute. Let me turn to, uh, to Florendo. Florendo, uh, the question really about language in, uh, in Angola, how do young people navigate this, you know, the, 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 the challenge that you, you, uh, you talked about? And in addition to that question, I wanna add one more, right? When it comes to elections, we've seen young people, uh, in, in young people's involvement in elections sometimes uh, being used by, politi uh, by politicians to address or to, 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 to get them to, to win the votes. And so once the politicians are done or they're they, 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 they elected, then young people are pushed uh, to the side. How could we use, you know, again, this young people's involvement in political processes, right, in a very positive way, right, to address some of the challenges that you've mentioned uh, as we go. So you have two questions. And of course, the last one is, if you had to give any advice to young people who are listening to you right now, and also to policymakers who are also on the line, 
what would that advice be uh, in, a, in few words? So you have uh, the floor for about four minutes, uh, then you do so, and I'll give the chance to uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Nziako to, uh, to say a few words, uh, also share her word of advice, and of course, I'll give the last uh, word to uh, uh, Ms. Asafi Kampako. So Florendo, over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Joel. Well, the first uh, question about the language, and the, there are a lot of difficulties there to answer your question, to um, give a voice to their problems and to exercise advocacy and to um, extend their concerns especially when they're not heard, even in their own country. So I believe that youth have all have tried to navigate this, um, this hindrance through social networks. There are, we have um, automatic translation um, apps and they've been using those in a significant way like the facebook twitter um, and these have devices to help with translation and they the youth have been using this the second question i believe that with respect to elections Of course, it's very concerning. The, it's, it's impossible to win an election without the support of, of youth in Angola. That's a given. What must happen, and remember what happened the last time, is that um, a lot of uh, you, young people went to parliament and they could be serve as a bridge to remind whoever the party in power is that they should uh they should deliver their promises but we still need more youth in parliament and uh in political parties uh, positions of power in political parties what we have to do is to um exercise advocacy so that uh, young people can take a greater play and exercise a bigger role in the political processes and in political parties. Friends of Angola, um, our organization sent eight young people um, to Cape Verde for one month for an exchange program for one week, excuse me, so that they could interact with other youth and to understand the role of elections and local elections in uh, local development. And they saw that many young people who work, at, many people who work at the local level in politics are young people like themselves. And it's very important that they can leave the um, the situation in which they live and work and to go to other spaces and see how things happen there. And one thing is to know how, is to hear how things work and, and there's quite another to go and, and live that reality. And I would also say to, in terms of advice is for young people to join political parties. Um, that, that's been said. If you want to change things in your community, you have to take part. You have to participate in politics. Um, maybe you don't, not, not everybody agrees, but it makes a huge difference. So I tell young people to participate in the political process, and that's how we get change. And for the um, Angolan government to uh, consider youth more and their concerns, we, the, you know, 
the uh, older people may have a wisdom, but the uh, younger people have time. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. I think we're still having some challenges with Dr. Nzioka. So I'll turn over to uh, Ms. Asafika Bako. You have the final word. Thank you so much, Joel. I want to start off by just echoing what um, Florindo said earlier on in this conversation. I too believe that young people on this continent are incredibly resilient. And I, am, I applaud young people for trying their best and doing their best when the odds are, are stacked against them. Um, I want to also add that I, I want us to recognize or engage in the conversation around youth not being a homogenous group. I, I know we've said a lot about the youth, the youth, the youth, but the youth aren't a homogenous group. And I want to take it back to what I said earlier on in, in the conversation around the question of what we are doing for youth who are not in school, youth who have dropped out of school, what programs, what support is available for, for that um, group of youth. So in my advice to, to policymakers and to activists, I think that's where I, need to, I want to start is, is, is by recognizing that youth aren't a homogenous group. So we need to categorize youth into various groups and then start to understand what each group needs. So for instance, for out of school youth, how can we best support them? What programs are needed to support them? Are there apprenticeships that could be uh, developed to help them? Are there young people who are interested in, in being artisans? Uh, how can we support them? And then moving on to youth who have had the privilege, and of course it is a privilege to go to university on a continent where the costs of education is incredibly high. And those youth sometimes go to, to university and they find themselves sitting at home without unemployment, as we've heard and seen through the Afrobarometer data. How can we support those youth? Uh, a lot of jokes are made on social media about employers wanting 10 years of experience when young people have just come out of the university system? How do we create entry-level jobs for young people that support them to grow to the next um, phase of their career? And then for youth who want to, who want to explore further educational opportunities, how do we support them? Uh, during the Fees Must Fall protests in South Africa, a lot, of a lot was said about young people, but especially um, young Black Africans who don't go on to pursue postgraduate studies. And there were a lot of questions around why that is, but there are realities that are facing the youth that inhibit them from pursuing further education, from going on to do their masters and their PhDs? How do we support those young people who want to further their studies and enter into academia or take another route? So I, I think that, again, I want us to recognize that youth aren't a homogenous group. We have to start by categorizing youth into, into different groups and then start to assess their individual needs and then, of course, engage in conversation with them around what it is that they need, what forms of support would best suit them and enable them to take their careers to the, to the next level, whatever it is they want to, to pursue with their lives. But in, again, I just want to say that I applaud youth on this continent for being incredibly resilient there are huge odds that are stacked against young people on this continent. I myself consider that I have been very lucky. My life could have turned out very differently. So I, I, am, I implore you to keep trying, to keep doing their best. And yeah, and then governments, of course, and other actors must come in to support young people where we need the support. Thanks.
Thank you, uh, Ms. Asafi Kampako. Thank you, uh, Mr. Florendo Chivukute. And then also thank you to uh, uh, Dr. Nziako. I think uh, if I'll, I'll uh, my, my, my word will really will be to uh, echo uh, Ms. Asafika's comments, uh, nothing without, uh, 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 nothing about young people without uh, young people. So I think that's basically what we're saying. And then we've, we've touched on a lot of things. We've touched on the need for young people to be involved in oversight. We've, uh, we, we, we talked about the need for young people to be, you know, to create uh, the civic space, you know, or to be involved in the civic space. We, think, we talked about Florendo's uh, uh, advice to young people to also be involved in political process, enjoy political parties, uh, uh, join political parties, and if possible, also run for, for elections. So we've talked about a lot of things that relates to both, uh, you know, democracy and good governance. We address the need, you know, to, uh, to, 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 to lower the level of corruption uh, uh, in government in Africa and also for governments to uh, increase, you know, trust. Uh, that young people uh, have, uh, or, or to decrease the mistrust that young people have uh, in them. So on that note, uh, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the Africa Center and the African Union Youth Envoy and the African Union Youth for Peace Africa program. Uh, thank you, uh, our panelists. Uh, thank you very much for the insightful you know, uh, 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 sharing of ideas. Thank you again for uh, uh, Florendo for sharing the, candidly sharing the Angolan experience. Thank you, Asafika, for sharing your personal experience as well. Uh, uh, and thank you again, uh, participants who are on the line, for listening and for your questions. Uh, the next webinar uh, that we'll, uh, we'll have will, hap will, will happen in a couple months. Uh, we're planning to have our next webinar in August. And the focus really will be on youth and uh, maritime security, where how young people can contribute to the maritime space. So please uh, be on the lookout for... Uh, a link or a message from uh, my colleagues uh, here at the Africa Center. And thank you again for your participation and thank you for uh, listening to our, our, our dear uh, pa panelists. So with that, let me say thank you again and uh, have a great morning, great afternoon and great evening wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>